This week on Arizona Illustrated, Barrio Stories, Theater with Soul. If the Pueblo won't come to the Teatro, then the Teatro has to go to the Pueblo. Terry Etherton, Photography First. My wife often says to me, she goes, well, when are you going to retire? As long as I have a box of prints that aren't sold, I'm not retired. The Elegant Trogan in Arizona. We uh, sometimes refer to it as the holy grail of birds. And an Arizona profile. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. After a year of research and community collaboration, the internationally recognized Borderlands Theater is returning with its Barrio Story series. This time, they explore Barrio Anita, a neighborhood that's off the beaten path, rich with cultural history and ripe for this story to be told. Mark David Pinate and Milta Ortiz are the driving force behind Borderlands. Their vision for this exploration was born out of a desire to honor and celebrate Tucson's historic Mexican-American barrios. This is Barrio Anita from Borderlands. We did a survey in November, along with coming to a bunch of community meetings to really find out like, what was on the minds of residents of Barrio Anita. And the, the thing that came out highest was to get, get to know each other more. Like neighbors wanted to get to know each other better. It was this dance with the community and we had to get to know each other, artists and community residents. It's one of the oldest neighborhoods and it's overlooked in a way. So it felt necessary to, to tell a story. When you interview all the people from back in the day, you know, talking about what the body was like sort of at its peak from the 30s through the maybe early 70s. What everybody says was everybody knew everybody. And there was all this intermarriage uh, and people would you know, get married and build an, an addition or another house on the property. And, and there was just so much, so much safety and, and sense of belonging and, uh, and, and sense of being really tied to, to this land. And that, that's, that's gone, right? People don't know each other like that. And so to try to create something that would give folks an excuse to come out and to get to know each other was one of the big goals of this project. Where did the Barrio Stories series idea come from? Is that something that you'd had for a while or? It's people like you that come over here and ruin everything that we have settled. That's what I'm a Mexican, service. very, very proud of it. We were in graduate school and we saw precious knowledge. I just couldn't believe that this was happening and at that time it was 2012. And we watched it and we cried and we're like, we have to do something. My grandpa and my grandma taught me to be proud that I'm Mexican and these classes helped me because I actually know my history now. For someone that's felt so out of place, it feels good to have a home. The way things were going, I probably just would have just left school. Like, this space saved me in a way. Mark had the brilliant idea to write a play about the banning of Mexican-American studies, a, a docudrama play. This is all America, right? There was a heart at the core of this program. People who live here in North America tend to... Not just educating, but, but giving young Latinos pride and non-Latinos that were interested in this culture that we're also immersed in. And to take that away simply for political reasons, you know, to get votes, to, to fear monger. No, racism, man, you know, racism. I've experienced it growing up. My mother, certainly, and, and grandparents in many, many deep and, and horrible ways. And that's, to me, that's, that's what I saw was behind it. And um, as an artist, this was happening. Uh, I just needed to come here and, and do that work. It was the one thing that we could do to help as artists, right? It's like the thing that we could do to spread the word. So we came out just really initially to do, the, do this play. And I think there's a part of me that is still saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to put this Mexican-American history out there uh, in spite of the state who has now been found guilty of being totally racist by banning these classes. 
And that was the whole idea behind the Body of Stories project. It was about honoring, preserving Tucson's Mexican-American heritage. We try to find as many ways to incorporate the neighborhood, to, to, to include neighborhood residents in the making of it, not just like extracting stories from them. In the course of interviewing all these folks, we kept hearing about these backyard celebrations. And this is what people did before internet and, and probably really before TV took hold. And they would talk about being outside and, and cooking, there's all this food and there was live music, musicians, and there was dancing, and it would go to the wee hours. And many people talked about this with big smiles on their faces. And so I was like, okay, well, let's, let's try to recreate one of these backyard parties. We took all the videos when anybody mentioned a backyard party, all the, all the oral history interviews. We put all those clips together, and we, we projected them onto the tool shed there. So a lot of them were with, from in the, they married within the barrio. So as you walk in, you start to hear from the actual people what these parties were like, and then you keep going deeper in and get to experience a recreation of one. And then you get to hear the, the elders sing those old boleros. And then switch to a young person doing a, a, a poem spoken word piece about the barrio and what it means to them as, as young people. Then how do I teach your niños to reach the promised land? You teach them that they are already here. And as they sit with the consejo, they notice the barrio yawn and open its eyes and it gives the same buenos dias that it's given to our escuela and our abuela for years. And, uh, and then the final element was, was the people, you know, the, the audience, just talking and enjoying themselves. The other big area of focus was the, with the four giant screens in the vacant lot. So she was into those things that we, we, we take for granted. That was just straight oral history, you know, just, just wanting to collect those stories. And then once we had them, you know, how best to prevent them. And, and you could gravitate to a certain screen and really like focus in on these stories. Some of the children that didn't get killed were sold as slaves in Mexico or given to rich families in Tucson to work as servants. The mariachi stage was in honor of Davis Mariachi, which was the very first after-school mariachi program in Tucson in 1983. That program gave birth to all the other ones. I was literally running around from place to place, making sure everything was where it was supposed to be. And even through like my going back and forth really fast, I noticed beautiful things here and there, like the video playing over the house. Almost as if they had all come together to pose for this big photo. I, I love seeing the pride. It really does create a cool vibe, right? Like that sense of ownership, like this is our place. Like, let's take care of it. Let's be friends. Let's talk to each other. You know, let's populate our underutilized space, which is our neighborhood. If we're proud of where we come from, then we're better humans to each other, right? So at the end of the day, it helps for everybody to know their roots and to understand that they have history and that they have things to be proud of. We're trying to create the most beautiful, the most aesthetically pleasing, the most professional, high production values as possible. But we're working in tandem with community. I can't just be an artist for, for art's sake. Like there needs to be a real community building component to all of this. Otherwise, it's, it's not for me. These streets have held us together in six feet above and said, let's jump. Let's dance and never let go of this home. Terry Etherton is the most successful gallerist in Tucson, and now he's celebrating 30 years in his current location. Since 1981, 
Etherton Gallery has showcased the historic icons of photography, as well as the contemporary artists changing its course. A champion of the arts and the artist, Etherton has made an indelible mark on the landscape of photography, and he's not done yet. Well, the first four or five years, I thought I'd made a big mistake leaving San Francisco and, you know, good work there to come here. But once I kind of got into the rhythm of it and figured out how to do it, it's been a great ride. I don't plan to do anything different in the near future. I like to read the New York Times and have my coffee in the morning and I like to sit where there's good light. I get caffeinated, you know, I fill up my stomach and then I'm ready to go to work. This is our Mondays between shows. Thank you. Ken and I have been doing this together for, what, Ken, 35 years or more? We opened in 88. I think, Ken, I think you've hung every single show. Almost every show. Yeah. When you do this, you step back and you go, oh my God, look at that and that and that. But, you know, I guess part of it is intuitive. Part of it is, you know, I know this material. Well, part of it's had to do with the pattern. It also had yeah. to do with them looking this way. Yeah. And then and this, I didn't even think about this, but I realized, wait a minute, that's Imogen Cunningham yeah. and this is, is an Imogen Cunningham. Oh my gosh. Part of the reason we're doing this show now is that we get asked often about what, what's the focus of the gallery. And the focus as far as photography is pretty much post-World War II American. And this show is a reflection of that. The McCurry was a, kind of an easy choice. You know, I really wanted one in here to sort of introduce the fact that Steve lives here now and that we're going to be doing a show in September. And if you're going to put one picture in, why not that one? I'm from Illinois, from southern Illinois, Carbondale, to be exact. I was born and raised in that area and uh, got drafted out of high school, went in the Army for two years, came back on the GI Bill, went to Southern Illinois University, and then moved to San Francisco in 1973. I would often come to Tucson and visit friends I'd gone to high school with, and while they were off to work, I started going over to the Center for Creative Photography. I was down here once and just decided that I was going to move and open a gallery, just completely on a whim. I was sitting at the Egg Garden on 4th Avenue and saw a for rent sign at what is now how sweet it was, the vintage store. That was my first space. People often said, well, what was your business plan like? I said, I don't even know what a business plan is. My rent was $235 a month. That was it. It didn't take a lot to make it go, but it was still a struggle. I realized that people weren't coming to Tucson in the summer, and so I had to go to them. This was before the internet, this was before cell phones. So if you wanted to see a curator, you had to go see them. So I would load the car up with photographs and I had a road map. I had the Eastman House Guide to Photographic Collections which listed all the public collections with phone numbers of the curator. I had a Major League Baseball schedule because I'm a baseball fan. So I combined these trips to see curators with trying to see as many ballparks as I could. And I did that for three summers in a row. That really got me exposed to a bigger audience. For nearly a decade, this small gallery near the University of Arizona was a major Tucson display space for contemporary art and, most especially, contemporary photography. The Etherton Gallery closed this summer, but was replaced late last month by the greatly expanded gallery on South 6th Avenue in downtown Tucson. Well, basically, we needed more space. In the end, the name of the game is you've got to build an audience, and if you can get people to come down for more than one thing, they're much more likely to do that. What I hope happens now is that other business concerns, restaurants and shops and things like that, also can contribute. Heatherton Gallery, this is Terry. He's been downtown through a lot of ups and downs. If you consider that he's been in this building for 30 years, and I've always tried to put a positive spin on it. I've always encouraged people to come down here. For a lot of years down here, it was a roller coaster ride. And now it's really gratifying for me to be able to tell people that, you know, you don't have to believe me. Just come down here. You know, come down here tonight and see what happens, you know. We've been doing openings from 7 to 10 Saturday night from the very first show I ever did. 
Club soda, white wine. Yeah, help yourself. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> hope you enjoy the show. Well, let me know what you think. Free wine, good DJ, Saturday night. This is lovely. One of the most gratifying things is people come in and they go, wow, they go, is that Ansel Adams? Is that Harry Callahan? They can't believe what they're seeing in here. And the other in Tucson, they don't expect that. This show is a huge part of what Terry does and is known for. To bring all of this work out of the archive and show it is in one broad show like this is a big treat for us and for the city of Tucson. I don't know if I have a style or a particular taste, but I guess the one thing is I like things that are really well crafted. That's the one thing that you see that's consistent, whether or not it's 8x10 view camera work or whether it's, whether it's a Gary Winogrand. It has to be an aesthetic object at the end of the day. It's amazing what he's done. To think that you could open a commercial gallery of photography in Tucson, Arizona, and actually make it work, actually make it a going concern. It's just astonishing to me. This is an internationally known gallery, and we showcase work that you'll see in some of the biggest cities in the world. It's a big space. It's a nice space to come and meet people. We want people to come in and go, oh, I haven't seen this before. You know, what I don't want to do is, is, to, is to make it stagnant. And I think that's part of the reason that our openings are so big, is people know they're going to see something new. He loves, absolutely loves what he does. He never wants to close the gallery. If it was up to him, the gallery would be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My wife often says to me, she goes, well, when are you going to retire? And it's like, as long as I have a box of prints that aren't sold, I'm not retired. That's just the answer because I love doing, I love coming in here every day. It's amazing. I love it here. I moved here on purpose, you know, it gets hot, big deal. What's red, white, and green makes an odd croaking sound and migrates to Arizona this time of year? Answer, the elegant trogon, a rare and exotic find, is sometimes described as the holy grail in the birding community, and it's currently breeding in the wooded canyons of southeast Arizona. Nature and environment producer Tony Paniagua headed south to see if he could find this beautiful creature. Yeah, and he, he was kept sitting right back up in here. I'll take a look down here again. I came to Arizona to go birding when I first got started in the, I think it was the late 70s, early 80s, and this was one of the birds I wanted to see, and Madeira Canyon was where you came to see them. There, there weren't that many back then. I remember hiking all up along the trails here, listening for the barking, and then finally found one and saw it. It was a huge excitement after uh, seeing mostly Midwest birds before then. Here it is right there. Well, I think the appearance of the trogon is one of the really big appeals too. It doesn't look like a lot of our other North American birds. It looks like what you imagine birds are gonna look like in the tropics. It's almost parrot-like. It's that same size, bright yellow bill, emerald and ruby breast. Arizona is by far the place to come and see this bird. A few elegant trogons will overwinter in southeast Arizona in the Sky Islands, but the, uh, the time to really see them is during breeding season, so it's in the summer. A lot of people think, oh geez, southern Arizona in the summer, it's too hot. But these birds are in the Sky Island environment, so they're at elevation, they're in shaded areas, and it's a great opportunity to come and see one of the most unique birds that occurs in the United States. There's actually quite a few birds you can still see right now. Uh, the heat of the day like this, things do slow down, but just a moment ago, there was an elegant trogon calling out in the, down in the creek bed. We uh, sometimes refer to it as the holy grail of birds. 
It's part of the Quetzal family, found mostly in Central and South America and Mexico, and has a very unusual call. Sounds like a barking dog or a barking seal. It's a valuable bird in a lot of ways for uh, southeastern Arizona in general. It draws birders from not only the United States, but from all over the world to come and see this bird. We came here because of the birds. We were in Denver for three years, and um, I have birded in many places, but it's wonderful here. There are not too many people. If you're in Denver or you go to the Rocky Mountains, you just meet people at 12,000 feet, but here, generally, you can, you, you're just here, you're out in the open, and it's just so pleasant. They are just spectacular and beautiful. It's hard to put it in words how beautiful they are. It's like seeing a, a Monet or a river. We've met people here who've been here decades ago, and they still remember the, the, the first sighting of the Trogon. It's definitely in the top of the heap of birds that uh, people come to Southeast Arizona or Southern Arizona to see. But it's not the only bird. There's a lot of other birds. For instance, the five-striped sparrows only occurs in the United States a few miles from here. Buff-colored nightjar. There's currently nesting tufted flycatchers flame-colored tanagers. But you could literally fly into Tucson, get off the airplane, get your rental car, and be within elegant trogan habitat within just 30, 40 minutes in uh, Madera Canyon. I love to wake up in the morning and uh, have a cup of coffee and sit on a porch and, and hear and see these, these amazing birds. There's well over 60 species of birds that you can see right from here. People tell me often that I, they're, oh my God, you live in paradise, it must be amazing. And, and yeah, it really is, it really is amazing to live up here. It's a great life. Yes, what a beautiful bird. If you plan to visit sites where the elegant trogon resides, please be mindful and respectful of their environment as they are sensitive and vulnerable to disturbance while nesting. Larry Mungia lost his family, his job, and his freedom to drugs and alcohol. Then he had a religious experience that transformed his life and gave him a new purpose, guiding others to sobriety as Pastor Larry of the Sober Project. In this Arizona profile, we share his story. I'm good, I'm good. This is my first time here. Just, uh... When I started the church, some of the people I used to serve in the bar would come to church, and now I'd serve them at church. We would laugh because I would, I was like, oh, well, you're a, a, a vodka and tonic. Or I would tell them, oh, you're, a, you're a white Russian member, and they're like, oh. Like, that's how I knew them. And then I see them worshiping God years later. It's kind of cool. <laughs> All right. Woo. Well, this guy and, and, and two, two young girls just worshiping, singing. And, and they said, Larry, man, we used to rob churches. <laughs> Welcome, you guys. We got a first time. So this is the first day. This is how it starts. Those are the things that are completely from one extreme to another that we get to see happen at the Sober Project. This whole thing started because of I was an addict, and I was a drunk, and I needed help. And My name is Larry Mungia third generation Tucsonan. I'm a pastor of a church here in Tucson called the Sober Project, S-O-B-E-R. It stands for service, obedience, bonding, education, and relationships. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we work with men and women and families coming out of addiction into recovery through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's kind of what we do. 30 days? Come and get you. <laughs> My dad was uh, born in a little dirt floor house over here off of 10th Street by, by the community center. And during the 60s and 70s, you know, 70s in high school, and just, to, you know, ran dope, you know, ran a lot of smoke out of the country. And then the big cocaine stuff coming into town, which dealt with some cocaine and stuff. But I was mostly a bartender and a musician. I played music around town. I worked on, on, on Grant Road at some hard bars, and that's what I did. I was a guy that went in there and tried to make peace, and I had that reputation. 
They used to call me Scary Larry. In May uh, 2nd of 1997 was when everything changed for me. And I had my, my God epiphany uh, at a Promise Keepers event in California. And I came home and uh, to rebuild my relationship with my wife and my family. I lost everything. I lost my wife, my children, my health, my family, everything. But when God came into my life, I got my wife back, my kids back, my home back, my health back. I baptized my brothers and sisters, and I got a future like never before. Church, I'll just be real with you, man. It's always the same, man. It's my ego, my pride, and my fear and my doubts all rolled up into one. But we ask you, Father God, to take us right now and, and to, and to, and to t teach us, to correct us, not condemn us. There's a huge problem of drug abuse in our community, not seen like this in a long time. And we've seen it's devastating and it's killing, it's killing, killing our kids. So that it sticks this time, man. I want it to stick. It tears the families apart, just like anything. That's awesome. Praise God. All right. But on the other hand, the recovery opens up an opportunity for reconciliation. Oh, you just swooped in. Congratulations, we yeah. all. All right. No way. Are you ready? Oh, my gosh. Fe February 28th. February 28th. Well, I'm here to shine the light of hope for those that already got those family members. They got those Uncle Larry's that uh, maybe drink too much or party too much, uh, that they know that uh, maybe they have somebody out there. There's hope for them and there's hope for their families. Amen, thanks guys. Come hang out with us, man. If there's good, so much devastation of the addiction, then we gotta turn it around and make it really good for some people. Come see us now. I think that's what we're trying to do. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, New Americans, red, white, and blue. I came out here as a young kid to, the, to this country, across the border, Mexico. I've been here for 30 years, and now I became a U.S. citizen. And I want to say thank you, and congratulations to everybody. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.